Hello guys, I want to give a short short message about HIV testing and services. HIV testing and services, this can be a short course that you can take uh, if you have done any health related course, any health science related course. So first we are supposed to know that what is HIV and what, what is AIDS? When we talk about HIV, this is in full, it is human immunodeficiency virus. This virus weakens the person's immune system by destroying important cells that fight diseases and infections. This virus cannot be detected by naked eyes, but can be viewed by the microscope or by doing antigen antibody test reaction. So that's all about HIV, human immunodeficiency virus. Let's talk about AIDS. AIDS is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. So as you have heard the first word, it is acquired. What is acquired? This is something that you may get due to certain thing being weak in your body. So you acquire it into your body. So AIDS is not a virus, but a set of symptoms caused by the HIV virus. So, for example, a person who has HIV, some of the acquired diseases that can get because the immune is weak, they are like pneumonia, malaria, tuberculosis, and many more. Yet they take advantage of your weak immunity so that they be in your body. That is like acquired. You have acquired that infection due to lack of immune strong immune in your body what are the risk factors of hiv infection having these are some of the risk factor i'm going to give you seven of them risk factor for hiv infection number one having unprotected vaginal or anal sex second one is having sexual transmitted diseases or infections like Media, syphilis, and many more. The third one is sharing contaminated needles, syringes, and other injecting equipment. Then the fourth one, receiving unsafe injections, blood transfusion, tissue transplant, and other more. The fifth is having multiple sex partners. The sixth one is experiencing accidental needle strike injuries. And then the seventh one is a pregnant woman having HIV to an unborn baby through birth or breastfeeding. Those are some of the risk factors of HIV infection. The next path that I'm going to take is HIV prevention key approaches I'm going to give you key approaches for HIV prevention number one individual can rebuke the risk of HIV infection by limiting the risk exposure of HIV risks the second one they are the second one that I'm going to give you is limiting and limiting and sharing of an sterilized sharp objects the third one is consistency and correct use of condoms and then when we talk about consistency and correct use of condoms under this we have biomedical intervention strategies to reduce exposure this is like male circumcision when we talk about male circumcision 50 percent to 60 percent risk reduction this is like PMTCT blood transfusion the second thing here we want to talk is about behavioral interventions HIV testing and risk reduction is like counseling behavioral change communication and promote risk reduction that is like condom use uptake of HIV counseling and testing this is all about behavioral interventions use condoms counseling you be counseled and then the the third one 
is social and cultural interventions. Community dialogue and mobilization to demand HIV service in order to reduce stigma. Let's talk about HIV positive living. So here, there is no care for HIV infection but can be managed through ARVs. When we talk about this, we mean that HIV does not have cure, but it can be managed. Use the condoms the right way every time you have sex. So you're supposed to be learned or you're supposed to be shown how to use condoms well when you are doing or when you're having sex. And then another thing, Encourage HIV positive clients to regularly take ARVs as recommended by the healthcare workers. If you inject drugs, never share needles. This is because when you share needles with an injected person that has HIV, automatically if you didn't have this virus in your body, you will get it. Also, Encourage your partner to know his or her HIV status. So if you have a partner and you don't know if uh, she or he doesn't have, ensure that you tell her to tell her or him that you know it's better we know your status each other. You visit the VCT center or HIV testing service center and then you'll be you'll be checked. Let's talk about communication in counseling when you talk about communication in counseling we have to understand first what is communication communication is the transmission of ideas through opinions from one person to the other with the aim of getting a feedback we have different types of communication who can name them okay let me tell you and then after the topic i'm going to ask you a question First, we have verbal communication, that might be oral. And then the second one is non-verbal communication. This is use of gestures, nodding. Nodding is when you shake your head, facial expression, the way you look your face, smile, sad. And then we have body marks. What are some of the elements or components of good communication? A good communication must have a sender. The sender must have a message. The message must go to a channel. The channel must ensure that it reaches the recipient. The recipient must give a feedback. So there are five. Sender, message, channel, recipient, and feedback. Let's talk about the barriers of effective communication. Number one, we have language barrier. What do we mean then when we talk about language barrier? For example, you are a Luo and you are, you are in Trukana or in Kisi or in any different language people. So you may be passing information to them using Kiswahili or English and they don't understand that language. What will you do? You have to look for somebody who understands the local language and then he, he or she can be translating to them. So language barrier, you don't understand and they don't understand you. That's number one. We have age difference. For example, you are 13 years old and you're supposed to explain something to people who are 65 years or 70 years. What does this mean? Whatever they talk or whatever they think, they will see you like you're too young. So their thinking capacity will be different from yours. So it's better for a person who is who is older to explain for people who are young, younger people to explain to older people. And then we have time. Time can be barrier effect. And the, it's the same thing that happens nowadays. In classes, when it's time for lunch and you're in class teaching students, students will switch off completely and their mindset will be like, we're supposed to go for lunch. We are not supposed to be in class. So time and then we have distance you are in kenya and you're supposed to communicate to somebody who is in the united states or who is somewhere very far 
the means of communication that you're going to use might be difficult to get there. All the information can get there, but it will not be as at it was needed urgently at the moment. We have knowledge, we have poor health, we have mental status, we have attitude, dressing, in dressing, let me talk about it. You may find some ladies coming to class in like they want to tempt male teachers. They dress half naked. And then when the teacher is in front of you, you know what? As men, they can be, they feel, they can feel any time because this is like a temptation. Why dress up naked and you're coming to class? So the communication will not be correct because this male teacher may be, his mind may be, what? Look at this. Then we have environmental destructors. For example, you are standing next to a road, vehicles are hooting, passing here and there, or there is somebody who has a miller, a portion mill somewhere, it's making a lot of noise, so that environment, that environment, it's really making it hectic for learners. So those are some of the communication barriers. And what are some of the qualities of a good communication qualities of good communication are like you be timely you set your mind that i'm going to preach for 16 for 40 minutes and that i'm done don't preach for more than 40 minutes people will switch off and they will not get you another is accurate the point that you are going to give people ensure that that point is very very accurate and it's not wrong short and precise you be short to the point, the point that you are giving your people. Ensure that it's short and it's to the point. If you are going to talk about water sanitation and hygiene, just go straight to water sanitation and hygiene without giving long, long explanation about it. You just talk about it briefly and the message will be taken. We have simple clear and specific you be simple just be simple clear and you be specific of what you are talking about and then another thing that you're supposed to know is that you be acceptable the community that you're going to give this information or to people you're going to speak to ensure that you be accepted by the client that you're going to talk to you should you should have a feedback from the client Let's talk about uh, counseling techniques. We have a technique here, just like shoveler, downward, like S H O V L E R, downward. S means sit upright, squarely, and face each other. This is when the communication, the information will be taken. Head nods. As your client is explaining or is talking to you, ensure that you shake your head, but don't shake it too much. You just shake it. You you nod, not shake. You nod your head gently to show the client that you're getting the information. Open posture. That is O. You adapt an open posture. Like the posture you are seated, ensure that it's open to the client. And then we have V, verbal following. L is learn to the other, like you lean to the other. Like when you, you have seated upright, don't just sit like a boss. You slightly bend forward to the other, but don't bend too much you bend slightly forward. These are some of the counseling techniques. And then, make eye contact. Look at each other eye to eye. That's when the information will be taken correctly. And then the last R, you relax. Relax and you get the information. Another thing, I want you to write the word gather. 
dumb one. G A T H E R. If you have written that word, number one, this is when the client or you have visited the client. What are you supposed to do? Now, I have visited the client to his place. Number one, you greet warmly. You ask the client's service needed. This is the second A. Ask the client's service needed. What service does your client need? Tell the client service available. Oh, sorry. This is now when the client has come to the facility or the place where you are offering this HIV testing and services. Number one, you greet warmly. And then you ask the client service needed. And then you tell the client services available. And then you help the client to choose appropriate services. And then you encourage the client to take part in the chosen service. And then you refer, revisit, return the date. So after you have done all this, that's when you refer the client or you revisit. After you have encouraged the client to take part in the chosen services. And then you may refer, revisit or return the date. We have some of the counseling skills. I'm going to give you some of these counseling skills. One as I explain. Number one, we have immediacy. What do we mean when we talk about immediacy? Immediacy, this is now intervening before the situation becomes worse. For example, your client has gone out of mood or out of temper. What are you supposed to do? You intervene by doing something before the client's temper goes too high. The second counseling scale is empathy. Remember, empathy is not sympathy. Empathy is when you give client time to express his or her emotion. The third one is focusing. You bring attention to the client back to the main session. So when the client has spoken a lot of stories, take the client back to the main point, the reason as to why the client is there. And then after focusing, we have clarity. Clarity is one of the counseling skills. Make things clear and well understood. So if the client, you know, we have different type, we had different types of clients. Uh, an illiterate client may come, or a bright client, or a learned client, or any type of client may come. Make sure that you use simple recite short and understood words that this client may you understand don't go beyond that just do it like to anybody do it like that we have summarizing this is asking key points from the client words ask key message key reasons that you want to get information from them and then we have active listening Observe non-verbal and listening to words in order to give appropriate response. Questioning. We have gone to the seven counseling skill. This is questioning. Open-ended questions are engaged. We have oh, that's that's simple. Observation, seeing and identifying what the client is saying. Like you just observe. Observe is just looking. Paraphrasing. Repeat the client. Say it in different words without changing the meaning. Replace. Paraphrasing. Repeat what the client said in different words without changing the meaning. So if the client has said something, repeat that thing that the client has said in a different way. Use different words. That's now paraphrasing. We have reflection. When you talk about reflection, this is when you help the client to review emotions and how it affects him or her. We have self-disclosure. Counselor gives his or her story. 
to make the client understand better so as a as a as a as a as a, as a counselor use yourself to explain like you give a reason you know this happened to me and you know what i came out as a conqueror i did this so that you make the client to understand more better and then you use with caution use this with caution we have minimal prompts use encourages eg nodding your head and but this nodding should be minimal another thing we have attending this is the 13th th counseling skill attending being available to the client observing the observing and repeating the client's words without understanding so this is now attending being available to the client observing and repeating the client's words through understanding the 14th one is mirroring what is mirroring by the way repeat what the client said without changing it without changing and non-verbal and then we have propping this is a challenging skill used to get more information from the client propping this is when you ask questions to know deeper information of what the client has been saying you, you ask simple simple questions so those are 15 counseling skills that i've given you let's talk about qualities of a good counselor when you talk about qualities of a good counselor, he or she should be observant. So observation simply means knowing the client that comes in for counseling better through observation. Self-aware. Self-aware is acceptance. Let me just name these qualities of a good counselor. I think they are self-explanatory. Confident, like you don't fear anything. Empathetic. Life skill. Life skill is now self-control or creative or talkative. We have being organized, non-judgmental, and then you maintain confidentiality. Confidentiality, this is that the client has come. You just don't go everywhere saying, you know, somebody and somebody came. That is your secret, please don't share to anybody anything that you have done with the client it should be remain between you and the client and that's all so what is the role of hts counselor hts counselor this is hiv and testing service counselor often both be like pre and post counseling for clients you should offer both pre Counseling and post counseling for clients include testing of results. So the other thing that we're going to do to the other role of a HTS counselor is participate in referrals, linkages, and follow up. Another third thing is offer quality HIV testing. The fourth one is promote behavioral change activities. The fifth one is creative, create demand of HIV activities. And then the sixth one, fill appropriate HIV tools. And then the seventh one, you participate in reporting HIV trends. And the eighth one, you offer HIV education. Let's talk of the role of, uh, no, let's go to the theories of counseling. Theories of counseling. Number one, theory. So let's first understand what is theory. Theories, these are thoughts, ideas, speculations, rumors that tries to explain a phenomenon. Counseling theory, these are ideas that tries to explain human behavior and how they can be they can be uh, existed to correct their behavior. Reasons for studying counseling theories. Theories help counselors to understand creation, to understand certain clients. Fatherly behavior. 
and the reason why behavioral so behavioral and the reason like the theories help counselors to understand certain clients furtherly behavior and the reasons they behave so therefore develop ways to correct them types of theories we have we have number one behavioral theory personal centered theory we have geared egan model and then we have psychoanalytic theory let's start by psychoanalytic theory it was by stigmat freud assumptions this is the assumption of segment freud human beings are born with psychot by um psychotic energy open energy of the of a child early development might influence later personality and initial forces are strong in influencing behavior so this is personal desires the fourth one is unconscious motives may influence behavior so this is now like feelings motives and decision being influenced by past experience main ideas or key concepts they are like normal personality is an result of proper integration of psycho sexual stages of development we have oral stage anal stage we have phallic stage latent stage and we have adolescent stage when we talk about oral stage this is 0 to 18 months remember we are talking about psychoanalytic theory oral stage this is 0 to 18 months it occurs between birth and about 18 months infants get pleasure from their mouth they are associated with behavioral such as eating and thumb sucking the lipido is located in the mouth are you getting so fraud believed on infant cannot develop oral fixation if oral needed are not met another thing is anal stage this is one to three years it occurs between one to three years it's a stage when the child interest is focused on the anal at this stage the child begins to toilet train which brings about the child's fixation in the in the arrogance zone of the anus and then we have the arrogance zone is focused on the ball and bladder control follic stage this is three to six years it occurs between three to six years and the infant's lipido this, this when we talk about lipid desire it's centered upon their genitalia as irrigation zone may and then manipulation of their genitalia become a major source of pleasure another thing here is they carelessly understand and explore each other and their genitalia and then we have the of uh, the odibus complex stage this is three to six years this is a stage when a child begins forming a described sexual identity and then it alters the dynamics of the the parents and the child relationship example a boy who acts like possessive or like a boy who acts possessive of his mother and tells the father not to touch her a girl who declares wants to wants many father when she grows up and then we have latency stage this is six years six to eleven 
this is a stage where the child considers with the like the child consolidates with the character habits he or she develop in the first three stage child acquires culturally regarded skills and values the child has developed from the body with primitive drives of a uh, of a like the primitive drives to a reasonable human being with complex feeling like shame guilt and disgust and then adolescent stage this is 10 to 11 years this is a stage of life between childhood and adulthood unique and important time in laying the foundation of a good health children undergo physical and personality and social development faulty behavior is a result of improper mixing of stages of personality we have id ego and super ego id this is an impulsive like is an an conscious part of our faith of our psyche which responds directly to the immediately directly and immediately to basic age needs to be desire i.e body crying because he or she uses was anger and babies mostly lack organization perceiving have psychic energy and it has inconsistency ego stage first three years of the child link behavior with external environment it involves the mediate between unrealistic id and extended real world a child setting a reason on it and then we talk about super ego we have a typical branch of personality judge one morally it is part of the person's mind or personality that tells them how the behavior based on and morals and values e.g returning the stolen item so these theories there are many i think i'm not going to to, to tell you all of these theories let's go up to talk about couples and hiv aids so what do you mean when we talk about couples and hiv aids we have these are persons in an intimate sexual romantic relationship that's now couples we have different types of couples we have married couples we have engaged or dating couples we have polygamous couples we have reuniting couples and discordant couples Core conditions for couples counseling and testing number one have to be cancelled together this is now for couples they have to be cancelled together have to be tested together rate their results together discuss their risk common together and then present thoughts the session that like they should be present throughout the session another subtopic is types of results of couples both positive that is co con like co content co content co positive both negative when they like let me repeat this so that you can get the point well there are different types of results for couples when both couples are positive these are co content positive when both both couples are negative these are co-condent co negative and when one positive and one negative this is a discordant result like they disconnect and then let's talk about the benefits of couple testing when we talk about couple testing number one you promote family support number two 
you promote better drug adherence. Number three, you reduce stigma in a family. Number four, you reduce HIV transmission. Number five, you promote shared information. Number six, you promote coping and living on. Number seven, one partner may act as a treatment support to the other. And the qualities of a good couple is like they have a strong self-awareness. The second one, they balance the client in the counseling session, both contribute and, and participate. The third one, they understand couples relationship in terms of cultural. This is like, you know, we have lesbians, straight and gay. The fourth one is able to manage intensity in the counseling session. This is deal with the emotion. And then we have something that we call disclosure. Let's talk about disclosure. This is when an individual reveals his or her HIV status to, to trusted friends, relatives, families, or significant others. Types of disclosure. We have client disclosure. This is when a client reveals his or her status to friends, family, pals, etc. The second one is counselor assisted disclosure. In the presence of a counselor, a person can reveal his or her status to the other person. And then the third one is disclosure by the courts of law. This is a state, this is a type of disclosure ordered by the court of law, e.g. rape taken to court. The fourth one, healthcare worker to healthcare worker done both HTS counseling. The fifth one is peer disclosure. People of the same age group, they can share. The sixth one is disclosure on the death certificate can certain the cause of death. The seventh one is third party disclosure. It involves infants, children, and these individuals who are unconscious due to the illness or mentally challenged individuals. So let's talk about factors to consider in disclosure. Number one, age of the client. Number two, stage of the mind, like state of the mind, either she's not good in mind. The third one, when to disclose. These factors that you should consider when you want to disclose. The fourth one, who to disclose to and the relationship to the person. The fourth one is confidentiality. And the fifth one is please, is the place of disclosure. And what is the process of disclosure? We have preconception. This is when the client is not willing and not ready to disclose. The second one is contemptation. The individual is willing to disclose, but still weighing options. The third one is ready for action. The client is willing and ready to disclose. And the fourth one is action. The client participate in disclosure. So let's talk about the benefits of disclosure. It helps to socialize family support. It reduces stigma and discrimination. It promotes better drug adherence. It reduces HIV transmission. It promotes coping and living, living on. One partner may act as a treatment support in case the discordant couples. The seventh one, it promotes partner testing. And the eighth, support HIV healthcare and treatment. This is family index testing and counseling. Let's talk about alcohol, drug, and health, and health, HIV, AIDS. So first, we're supposed to know what is alcohol. Alcohol is any drink that contains ethanol, and it is produced by formation of grains, fruits, or other sources of sugar. 
And then what's a drug? A drug is any substance that when inhaled, injected, smoked or consumed, it causes temporary physical changes to the body. What are the effects of alcohol? It increases sexual urge, that's like sexual desire. It leads to memory loss that can lead to mixed doses like poor adherence. The third one, alcohol. Some alcohol reacts with ARVs. And then the fourth one, it causes liver problem, hence, hence interfering with drug metabolism. So let's talk about, uh, uh, let's continue with the effects of alcohol. Fifth one, it might lead to excessive means, excessive menses in women, hence causing inf uh, unfaithfulness in the relationship. The sixth one, it's premature ejaculation in men. It leads to wife cheating, hence might pose health risk. So, some drugs like heroin also cause HIV transmission through sharing of syringes. The eighth one, it reduces the lifespan of an individual and then it may lead to poverty, healing to poor, leading to poor health care. So, let's talk about the packages of HTS. What are some of the packages of HIV testing and services. Number one, we have two types of tests, screening test and confirmatory test. Under screening test, this is a type of test done for all clients who come for HIV testing. In screening test, we have to use a test kit called Determine. It is sensitive test kit that can detect false virus. Confirmatory test, this is a second test done for all clients who test positive in the first test. This is now screening test. It uses a test kit called first response, FR. Something you're supposed to note is if the client test results becomes unreactive, that is negative, with the test one, record the record and give the result. And if the client result becomes reactive with the first with the first response, confirm by using the first response as the test two. And if still reactive, then record and refer the curative care clinic or comprehensive care clinic for retesting. If the client test result becomes reactive with the test one. And on the confirmatory with test two becomes unreactive, then record inconclusive and refer the client to the curative care clinic for retesting. So we have two things here, reactive and non-reactive. Reactive, this is the test refers to evidence of HIV. Non-reactive, test did not find any evidence of HIV. And then we have types of testing. We have repeat testing, that is the first one. What is repeat testing? It is a type of test done immediately on the same testing site with the same tester done especially for insolid results, invalid results. The second one is retesting. So I've said about repeat testing and now I'm talking about retesting. Retesting this is done after a certain period of time in the same service delivery point or in a different delivery point by a different tester. And then let's talk about scenarios for retesting. Which scenario can lead to retesting? Number one, for those clients who test positive first and second round at the curative care clinic, for those clients with inconclusive results. And then the third thing, pregnant women at the ANC visits. And then the fourth thing is persons with high HIV risk exposure. Let's talk about retesting guidelines. When we talk about retesting guidelines, general population can be tested 
yearly. They can also be tested after exposure, retesting of key population that is sex worker and etc. And when we talk, uh, the third the third point I uh, have of retesting counseling is inducive results at the curative care clinic act after two weeks the fourth one pregnant women test them in the first trimester of pregnancy in the first ANC clinic visit the test in the third trimester of pregnancy labor and delivery and three months after delivery and then we have symptomatic STI patient must be screened after four weeks and TB patient can be tested after four weeks. Persons with, uh, with recent HIV exposure retest them after four weeks. Persons who react HIV positive are the first time in the CCC. We have discordant couples retest at the intention, at the initiation at the positive partner on the care then after six weeks then after three months then six months until the viral suppression has been achieved if still negative proceed to annual retesting and recommend for prep so let's talk I will I will give you the HIV testing service algorithm. I will give you that. Uh, I will give you that. So 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 I want to talk about the community issues and HIV and AIDS. So first, what is a community? This is a group of people living in the same geographical area, sharing the same culture, beliefs, norms, problems, and benefits together. And then this is the administrative structure of the community we have the village the village is led by the clan elder we have the sublocation sublocation led by the sub chief and then we have the location led by the chief we have the sub county led by the deputy county commander coordinator and then we have the county the governor and then we have the region we have regional coordinator in the country led by the president so today, oh, so let's continue and I want to talk about mobilization now. Mobilization. Mobilization is bringing people together for an action, inviting or getting people to come to participate in that activity. And what is the reason for mobilizing? Create awareness on health matters. You educate the community on health matters. Achieve the program goals and targets. And then you promote ownership on health-related matters by community members. And then teamwork with community workers' pressure. And then we have you create demand for the service. So that's the reason for mobilization. I've said about six reasons. One, I've said create awareness on health matters. Two, I've said educate the community on health matters. Third, I've said about achieve the program goals and targets. Fourth, I've said promote ownership on health-related matters by community members. Sixth, and sixth, I've said, no, fifth, I've said teamwork with community workers creation. And then the sixth one is create demand for the service. And then mobilization strategies. What are the strategies that you can use to ensure that your mobilization has been successful? Number one, media, e.g. radio, television. You go to the television, study the media, and when you present something and you say something, uh, a specific day, a specific place, a specific action is going to be taken from this time to this time. Please welcome. Like you present it on the media platforms. And then we have mobile tracks. This is beyond zero campaigns. You, you just go into the message. You type a message. You invite people. We have crowd. Crowd. We have the crowded places, like you go to the market and then you pass with public address system and then you tell them. You can use posters and billboards. You use posters, you pin in the everywhere so that people can read it. And then use of E, use of IEC, information, education, communication. These are some of the materials that are being written. You maybe give them as handover so that they can go and read. 
Let's talk about the target population on HIV and AIDS. General population, these all adults. We have infants and children. This is promotion of EID or HEI. So, when we talk about EID, what is it in full? How to strengthen this EID is early infant diagnosis. So, how to strengthen early infant diagnosis? Test all children and infant who present for who, are, who present for treatment in the facility. Number two, test all orphans and vulnerable children or VC. Number three, test all children and infants who parents died at unknown diseases. Number four, test all children whose parents are known positive. Number five, test all pregnant women who come to the ANC visit clinic. Number six, promote hospital delivery for all pregnant moms. And then number seven, promote hospital treatment for all infant and children. So, the B on this, I want to talk about youths and adolescents. These are now couples. Special category population. When we talk about key population, these are examples of key population. Number one, sex workers. MSM, this is men having sex with men. WSWS, this is when women having sex with women. And then IDUs, this is injectable drug users. And persons with disability, this is the second category of population. Persons with disabilities. So, these are mentally challenged people, physically challenged people, persons with harming Im uh, impairment, and then we have person with vision impairment. So, I said about person with hearing impairment and person with vision impairment. And then the third, the third special category population is target service for sexual and gender-based violence. The tag sorry, the target survivors of sexual and gender-based violence are rape, defilement, and incest. Incent, this is relatives. Another special category for population is vulnerable target. These vulnerable targets, these are people that are suffering. They have a specific problem, a challenge, like prisoners. Prisoners, the place they stay, the place they live, they are men only inside there. You know, when they are men, they can... Sex desires. Men can have men-to-men -men sex. That is MSM. So these are vulnerable targets. We have long-distance truck drivers. Those drivers that drive in long distance. We have women of the age between 15 to 24 years. And we have um, we have street children. We have fisher focus, we have gold miners and refugees. So, you have gotten a client to your facility. How do you refer this client? This is how to refer a client. Access the client's needs. Get the client's needs. That is the first. The second one, you explore the client's feeling. Like the client, is this client comfortable being treated or being done the service in this host facility? The third one, you explore the client's need. What is this that the client needs? Ensure that you know. And then the fourth one, you identify the client's facility of choice. Identify which, which facility does this client want so that you can refer the client there. And then the fifth, identify the client needed services are available. So after you identify if the client's needed services are available, then you will know how to refer or where to refer this client. And then you identify the contact person in the facility, the person that you are going to refer this client to. And then you fill the referral form MOH 100. The MOH 100 is just a referral form. It will be filled either from the community or from the facility to facility. And then number eight, we have give an exit referral form. So if you give the client an escorted referral form, he or she will take that form. 
So le let me talk about infection control and prevention objectives. Number one, explain the safety or uh, explain the safety and practices in HTS setting. Number two, you are there to personal health and safety practices. And then number three, you explain general policies covering policy procedures and practices. And then number four, you practice safe disposal. And then number five, take appropriate intervention following accidental exposures. Let me talk about number four. Number four, control objective practice safe disposal we have different types of beans that are supposed to dispose we have a yellow bean red bean safety box and then we have a black bean a black bean is used to dispose those things that are non-infectious like papers pens such things uh, like banana peels they are being disposed in a black bean a red bean is used to dispose most infectious materials or objective and the safety box is used to dispose sharp objects like needles, laser blades, scalpels, and so forth. And then the yellow bean is used to dispose infectious materials like gloves. And then another thing that we're supposed to know here is the fundamentals of lab practices. Laboratory practices we have like staff education and continuous education, provision of safe building and requirements like good lab practices. And what is it about lab design? They must be adequate. The laboratory floor must not be carpeted or polished. Another thing, proper lightening and ventilation should be in the laboratory. And then the fourth one is that benches must be of the same standard height. And then number five, sink must have free flowing water and then number six must contain drawers and cupboards so what are some of the laboratory associated hazards we have biological hazards e.g blood body fluids and even used needles number two we have chemical hazards e.g reagents alcohol like ethanol and then number three we have physical mechanical hazards e.g equipment suppliers in on sub, like suppliers on the floor and then number four we have electronic hazard like electricity shock so let me tell you this mm, infection control practices are mandatory in all labs the importance of adherence to universal biosafety practitioners can be overemphasized in order to protect the HTS provider and the client from dangers of getting infected either accidentally or through cardinesses. So we have talked about that. Let me tell you this. How does the body respond to the HIV virus? Yeah. We have this thing that we call micro microphages. Mobile, these are mobile white blood cells. Microphages are mobile white blood cells. They respond by destroying all the bacterial and cells that have been found. And then we have the P cells. These are now lymphocytes. Lymphocytes, they are also responsible by producing antibodies specific to the virus. This can be done to help immune, immune restoration. And then we have the cytostic cells also respond by destroying the infected cells found in the immune cell. And then something that you're supposed to know that the P cells will also be produced by the memory cells that will be used in case of any similar reaction. And the number of health CD4, so, what do we mean when we talk about CD4? I will tell you. So the number of health CD4 cells remain can be estimated in the lab using CD4 count machine. So when your CD4 cells are too low, you will be advised on which medication or which action should be taken for you to increase your CD4 in your body. And unprotected vaginal and anal 
intercourse is 85% HIV transmission mode, mother to child during pregnancy, labor breastfeeding, it's 10% transmission mode, and blood transfusion for an infected person, sure bit, and then we have contaminated needles and sharp objects. So, we have some stages of mourning. When we talk about stages of mourning, this is by Elizabeth Kipler Ross. Stage number one is denial stage. This is now we are talking about loss and grief. Loss is a feeling of failure. It is a complete separation from a person or objective valued. And then emotions that, that one undergo as a result of loss Carried. And then mourning is the stage a person passes through as he or she comes to accept the loss and is accompanied by pain through that may lead to the outputting of emotions. So stage number one is denial stage. Denial stage, this is when an individual fails to accept the outcome of the test, like you don't feel to accept the results. It's denial stage. Anger stage, this is a stage whereby an individual feels feels the sudden and the sorrowfulness. Number three, we have bargaining stage, feeling of regrets. Number four, we have depression stage. This is the main stage of of the main stage of mourning. It is when there is the loss of appetite, loss of or weight, and then we have acceptance. This is when an individual accepts he or she status of life. Virology and immunology. Virology is the branch of microbiology, studying virus and then characteristics of HIV virus. It replaces multiply, it replicates or multiply. It has got its own enzyme, e.g. reversal transceptives, and then it has protest enzymes. It is, it is, it has lentivirus. This is low growth, and it is protectious envelope. So it is, it has RNA as an anti, and as a genetic material that is ribonuclear acid. So guys, I want to thank you for taking part of getting this information about the HIV testing and services guide. This is something that you need to know. Make sure that you subscribe, like, and comment.